Hello, and welcome to another episode of I Actually Have No Idea. It used to be Military History Verbalized, and then it kind of just degraded into a chat, so... Another video of talking to people that know things and asking them about those things. Now, joining me today is uh, Stephen Omri. Uh, he's probably also better known as Azumazi across um, various forums and things like that. He's done consulting for both Gaijin and Wargaming, and he knows an awful lot about the Imperial Japanese Navy. So welcome, Stephen. Thank you so much for having me again. So going into the specifics today, we're going to basically start off on Japanese armor, but going into that, we're going to go off on Japanese steel. Now, for a lot of people who don't know, uh, I would hope they might know, because some of this was taught even in my own high school history and here in the U.S., but some people don't. Started about around 1868 after the Boshin War, where they're bringing the emperor into the front, the shogun being cast out. A massive revitalization of industry was brought in from about 1885 to 1914, which would be sort of the late Meiji period. The entire industry had to be overhauled. This came into fruition through uh, three banks. Those three banks were basically known as the financial intermediary. They were the Hokkaido Col uh, Colonial Bank, the Industrial Bank of Japan, and the Nippon Ginko. These three banks basically through the Japanese diet would subsidize industries to get them to develop and come to fruition. Now, right after the War of Unification, bringing the emperor into power, Japan was bankrupt. And I don't mean that in a small joking sense. I mean, they were tearing down castles and selling raw resources to make money back. This is why you see so many sets of armors, weapons, Shinto, iconographs, all this stuff across the world because people were buying these items up and they were basically selling off heirlooms to basically pay back the government. It was actually kind of a depressing scene for them. So right after that, going to about 1875, they were actually able to stabilize through international funding and development of trade. Uh, the government's uh, Yokosuka shipyards had survived a lot of the enterprise that were sold off at, going into the 1880s. Most of Japanese shipyards and industry were privately owned by this point. Uh, well into 1895, Sino Japanese War. Uh, it actually got bad enough that Jap uh, Japan had requested to borrow naval vessels from other nations during the war and to pay them off later if they need to be. Uh, Britain nearly. Uh, caved in on this however the u.s and many others did not so going into this into the early i'll say 1908 japan started rapidly developing uh this started actually in what's known as the tokaido region or tokaido belt a lot of this development ended up expanding in an area around osaka and kobe and then from there, it spread upwards, what's known as the Kato Belt, going from that region, which goes into Yokosuka and Tokyo, so that whole southern section of Japan there. The reason why this was the selection that was chosen is that the Tokaido during the Edo period was a set of roads, known as the, the Five Roads. And this network of trade interconnectivity going all the way from Kyoto up to Edo, which is now modern-day Tokyo, they already had an infrastructure set, so they basically had paved roads. If, if you see pictures, they almost some of them look like like old style Roman roads, but they were there, so it's like sort of built upon this network system and modernize it. So after the, all these uh, were developed, the central area of development in that belt area and industrialization allowed them to create a boom. So the massive Osaka and Kobe complex that was developing alongside Tokyo and Yokohama allowed them to develop industry. The advantage of this was that with it being localized, it was a lot easier for them to do what's called a dualist economy. They were able to have a lot of synergy between 
different firms and also made it easier for them to industrialize power generation and feeding these factories. They also made it easier to do housing and training of these workers. Because the other big thing that had to come out of this period was education. You'll, you can actually go online and you'll still find pictures like in about the 1912 up to the 1920s era of a lot of the people still looking like their Edo period Japanese because it took a while to develop and get these people trained. Now, they were educated on how to read and write better than a lot of Western countries for a long time. Even some of the poorest people, if they joined the Shinto temple and such, would be taught a basic education on how to read and write in Japan during the Edo period. And a lot of this for religious reasons. Now, this is the same in the Western world, too. Like, a lot of people would go into missions and such with the Catholic Church or the Protestant, if you were English. But for that center, that was there. However, with the Industrial Revolution, you had everything from mathematics, engineering skills, electronics. I want to say electronics, I'm talking about the start of electricity, such as generation from DC and AC power, which was coming about. So they had to bring all these people up to speed. So... In 1910, this was still in its infancy, in a sense. You had a lot of the old industry still using old steam work. It wasn't until about 1920 that electrical machinery started coming to Japan. Okay. Now, Germany, the U.S., England were using electric-based machinery well before the Great War. That's how long it was taking for Japan to catch up. And it's just because they literally came on the scene about 150 years after everyone else. So starting in about right after the Great War, which ended in 1918, going into 1920, Japan was basically going into a, a golden era, so to speak. They had, besides the Kanto earthquakes, which caused major damage, they had a, a large revival and development throughout all their industries. Everything from power, shipping, mining, railroad, cars, pretty much you name it, they were, they were actually developing it. They, the same people who developed factories for Ford were coming helping to build factories. They were, they were revitalizing most of their industries. And a... Uh, a very popular YouTuber, um, which a lot of people know because he does the Great War Channel, uh, Indy Nidell, he speaks about the same period out across the globe and explains in very reasonable manners what happened to Japan, also happened to Germany. Right after the Great War, most people believe that, because they see all the pictures and hear about how Germany basically was wallpapering their walls with banknotes, uh, because of the inflation, well, at about 1925, Germany was basically what they called the Golden Twenties. They were in an uproar. They were redeveloping entire industries. They were doing really well. And that was because the U.S. was giving them very cheap loans to their banks to be able to borrow from the U.S. and then pay back France for reparations, allowing them to rebuild their industry. Japan was very much tied to the world economy like everyone else at this time. During this period, they were injecting funds into education, world developments, and bringing people into the cities for modernization. Well, 1929 rolls around, and you have the Great Depression. This hurt Japan probably the most. And the reason why this hurt Japan the most is because 80% of their steel industry was ran by one company. Oh, wow. That one company being Yowata Steelworks. Now, they didn't just produce steel as an armor. They produced all the steel. Everything from railroad use. Everything. So what ends up happening is this company, who's now becoming a more modernized piece, is developing this industry is now forced to take major setbacks and hold off on doing modernizations. So, going into Japanese ship development at this point, up until before the Washington Naval Treaty, 
they were more in line with what British development was, although they did look at other nations such as Germany and the U.S., and they did take a lot of concessions when they had taken uh, war prizes from Germany after the Great War and incorporated a lot of the designs that they liked, uh, a lot of being flash tightness they found was far better in their ships than the British base vessels, and they took a lot of that. Uh, to be honest, the British actually did too. They were quite impressed. Okay. So going into this development, Japan coming into the 30s, when they were going to look into developing their new capital ships, they had a problem. They didn't have the industry capable of doing the new higher-end grade steels. They knew the formulas, they knew the materials necessary, they couldn't do it. Now, it wasn't just the capability, the other part was is the necessary materials. The Great Depression hurt everyone, and global trade was the biggest thing that it hurt. Japan, being an island nation that did not have colonies like the British Empire did, was solely dependent on importing the necessary materials. Biggest one of those being, or biggest two being nickel and chromium. Their main importer was the U.S. The U.S. shut down a lot of mines in this period, which meant the cost of these materials went through the roof. So you have hyperinflation as well as supply and demand not being able to be met because, well, a depression is going on. And alongside the Depression, also in the U.S., there was a lot of riots, uh, unfortunately a lot of deaths for multiple different mines being shut down and rioting over it. So Japan was left in a very sad position at this point. Coming into the mid-30s, Japan is recovering a little better than most has because of the fact they had a more centralized bank system. They were able to funnel in and develop their industry as necessary but they still were reliant on imports so what ended up happening is they took the old design of the Vickers cemented plates at least for heavy armor and decided to look for ways to make it as effective as the original design of 1912 but at a cheaper cost so three factors were looked into for making it cheaper fuel costs this was a big thing because it cost, generally speaking, about 70% of volume of fuel to volume of steel to refine it. If you're using charcoal and coal or coking. If you're using open arc furnaces, you can get about a 40% to uh, mass ratio, which is better. And Japan did use open acid furnaces as well as arc furnaces. Now, the Korean Naval Yard in particular was looking for a method to design this cheaper as effective for now. And that's something a lot of people don't know about is that it was for now. They knew that they needed to modernize their Navy because they were just coming out of the Washington Naval Treaty. In this case, they got the London Naval and Second London Naval Treaties. And they wanted to rebuild their capital ship fleet. This was not nearly as much of a problem for their smaller vessels as they continued using basically the same armors they had been using in the past because they saw no actual need to modernize these armors. And a lot of that was basically high tensile steel, uh, Vickers non-cemented, with the exception of a new type of steel, um, which is not a CNC or copper non-cemented. They basically just took out a portion of nickel and replaced it with copper. Uh, copper actually in low amounts can be, can actually help steel uh, increase its hardness factor, which is uh, to the same ratio of, of nickel at a certain point. So this made it good for the fact that they had local copper mines to be able to subsidize this without having to use as much nickel for import. That was one of the main or only armors that they did this for. Uh, they did substitute very small amounts of copper for their larger plates later on, uh, especially the uh, molybdenum type armors. This was mostly just used in the Yamato class. But there had been other testing as well of substituting molybdenum 
versus chromium, and they found that that actually worked as well to substituting that a small amount. However, the issue with that is that molybdenum in too much of an amount and too less or too little chromium made it brittle. And this is also in, in view of thin plates, so they had to be careful with that. So, coming to this period, they basically saw what they have with Kawada Steelworks, Cray uh, Naval Yards, Yokohama Naval Yards, and their development, and went, okay, we're basically 20 years behind on some of these developments. And to make things worse, with the Depression, a lot of these skill workers who were being trained in the 20s were out of work. So their profession, or especially in the non-military sector, which is where you would want to pull in your people for doing large-scale production, were out of work and were no longer up to speed. It takes years to develop things like welding and machining. And with these people out of work, you lose these skills over time. Mm -hmm. This is also why you start to see certain issues with Japan having problems with some of their welding practices. Part of this was the fact that, as much as we don't know this, it takes you about three to five years of welding experience to be a proficient welder. A lot of these guys coming back in in the early 30s, going into the late 30s, many of them, you'd have one to 20 journeymen to apprentice ratio. Because a lot of them had to basically retrain or they didn't even get to fully train because this was a new technology. And Japan really just could not bring it in because of economic factors. I assume the um, probably the naval construction holiday imposed by the treaties also had a factor. Because I know Len Lenger and Alberg, sorry I butchered those last names, they do mention that basically, I mean, the production of thick armor plates stopped. Um, after the after really the kind of that Nagato Mutsu Tosa Amagi era in the late 19 teens early 1920s uh, and then would they'd continue researching and studying but that that practical experience of actually producing the plates hadn't occurred in a, quite a few years uh, really up until the Yamato class yeah they did develop some prototype plate just because mm -hmm. there was the Congo replacement program in the early 30s and a few others but they're, they didn't really do any large scale production for large plates but besides the ship holiday truth be told in the 20s there really wasn't much of a holiday yet. It, for capital ships yes but for everything else it exploded Oh of course yeah. So we're talking uh, them basically building light cruisers, destroyers, heavy cruisers, new submarines, and all of the things in between uh, mine layers, also torpedo boats, which basically were second-rate destroyers, technically third-rate destroyers, but basically under 500 tons. So they had a lot of ship products being made, but the problem was is that, and this is something that hurt everyone, they had a mindset of what they wanted to build on this plateau but they didn't have the industry or the capacity or the experience to get there yet mm -hmm. because of that depression economic downfall that nice steady incline started to apex and dip back down during the depression before it went back up so they were basically asking them to produce things that they didn't have the personnel to do yet and you ended up with a lot of failures of steel welding rivets and other features. There's been a lot of debate that the reason why certain ships were coming in overweight and other problems was this uh, issue. Yep. Because you didn't just lose people on welding casters who were, who were doing castings for bronze such that a lot of issues came out of those as well. And there's been a lot of speculation that you know, the industry could hit some people being laid off and let people go back to their farms you ended up with people, or not that, it was also uh, not really talked about a lot, and my people had to talk about, there was also a lot of suicides at this period too. So a lot of people who had a lot of experience ended up taking their own lives as well. So going into that, they basically were just, I mean, they were in a situation that they just had to use what they had on hand. Mm -hmm. Now, as I had uh, linked to you earlier, but everyone else hasn't seen it yet 
uh, one of the main things I always hear from people is they like people ask, well, I mean, you know, why didn't, you know, I mean, Japan just couldn't make, you know, good metal. They didn't know how. And it's like, that's actually not true. Uh, yeah. The biggest one I hear from people, people talking about the American uh, special treatment steel. And the truth is, Japan had a copy of that formula as of 1910. They knew the exact <laughs> chemical composition. The Carnegie Steel Corporation leased them the rights to produce on their own, or they can order directly from them. Yeah, which we'll put up on the screen right now. So. so they knew exactly what was required. And the reason why they knew is because Carnegie went to Germany because uh, Germany was looking for what's basically uh, horizontal protection or deck protection uh, steels. And the special treatment steel or protective deck plate, as it was always called at that time, Japan and many others were looking into it. Uh, Japan actually rather liked it. What they didn't like was what it required in it. And it required a high amount of nickel. Mm. I'm saying this now, they really couldn't afford that. It also required a high amount of chromium, 1.6%. That's not a small amount, or in the cases, it was uh, 373 to 3.75% nickel. And I give everyone an idea of um, just how much of a ratio difference that is. New Vickers non cemented had about 3.7 nickel to 1.8 chromium in its base form, but. Mind you, that was for plates over a certain thickness, of that over thickness being over 100 millimeters. And plates genuinely under 100 millimeters, they would prefer CNC, which is the copper non cemented. They drop that in a 2.5% nickel and between 0.8 and 1.3% chromium. So the chromium was. A little less but the nickel was a fair bit less and mine for the people out there listening might not sound like a lot with a, maybe a percent drop but when you have to entirely import your nickel reserve from another nation because you pretty much don't have it at all you're at the whim of where you can get it from uh, Japan did attempt to get it from other sources. One of the biggest other sources they attempted to get it from ended up being Russia, which is why they made such a hard push into Russia for the heart for the longest time going through the, their campaign in the Mongolia, which failed. Uh, the other reasons, because they had a lot of uh, raw materials on the Eastern side of Russia with in Siberia, uh, the biggest things being nickel, Tungsten, which Tungsten is also northern uh, Korean area, which is why they took over the whole Manchukuo section. Chromium, vanadium, manganese, and another big thing that they were going for was coal. Coal is in massive amounts in Russia. And the main reason why they wanted the coal there in direct control is the fact that Russian coal has... Low, low sulfate, which means when it burns, you don't get a lot of impurities in your metals. In China, the coal has high sulfate, which is why today in modern times, they have so much pollution coming out of it. The high sulfate content also creates more things like acid rain. But when you're making steel, it, bleeds, it creates impurities, which you require far more silicon to pull those impurities out. Mm -hmm. So a higher grade coal, when you coke it, which basically means you, you're basically cooking it down towards a uh, more pure carbon form where you're burning it, it gets hotter. It allows you to transfer more carbon into the st uh, to steel if you're using coal. Now, in the base iron production from a raw iron source, coal works well for those types of furnaces. Later on, when you're actually making steel plate, you don't use that method. You actually use CO2 gas, or really, you don't want to use CO2, you want to use CO, so carbon monoxide. Carbon dioxide uh, diffuses far better in the metal. It leaves a much better carbon footprint when you're actually trying to get depth in it as well. However, carbon dioxide is a little bit harder to process versus CO2. So a lot of times, and some of the Japanese industry did as well, is they use more CO2 gas for perforation, which is why 
the Gorn Able to get a hardness factor over about 550 uh, thicker hardness scale to 580. And they uh, they had a very high carbon content in the armors. It was about uh, 0.53, sometimes up to 0.8, which the U.S. when they tested them thought it was extremely high. And they thought it was odd they didn't have a higher hard, face hardness value. But the problem or the thing they didn't know about at the time was that instead of using carbon monoxide, since CO2 is far easier and it's far more abundant and easier to obtain, they were using that instead, and it doesn't get the same kind of depth penetration when processing the plates of the steel. So going into all of this, Japan basically was playing catch up, especially of, so starting off in 1910, Vickers Armstrong had supplied Japan with, with you know, most of their quantity of Vickers cemented plates. 1915, um, Japan patterned the above, and they did their first actual at-home plate. They did an experimental 200 millimeter, or actually 203 millimeters, eight inches exactly, figure cemented plate, and that was her first test plate. Okay. 1925 is when they started doing their experimental non- or uh, new figures non-cemented. And this plate was actually made with a high amount of nickel, and the reason why at the time was that they were trying to experiment how much nickel we needed, how little. They went all up to 4% nickel, which is a lot. But they were trying to figure a way to improve. In this case, there's only a way to improve upon the old Vicar, uh, the non-cemented Vickers plates for deck protection and or uh, vertical protection for light ships like cruisers. Because at this time, most uh, going into the... Let's see. The AOPA began using New Vickers non cemented for its vertical protection. All right, so under the lighter uh, Kumas, Nagaras, and all of them, they actually, for a, most, almost all of them were using this uh, high tensile steel for their side protection. Uh, Sendai, a lot of them. Then going into Ubari was the first one that they actually started using the uh, New Vickers non-cemented. Yeah, uh, and VNC. Side. Yeah. It, it was actually a mix. Some of it was the older Vickers non-cemented with New Vickers non-cemented just because they had spare plates. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, they were trying to keep it cheap because it was an experimental cruiser. Then going into... The Furitaka, that's when they started using the New Vickers Not Cemented for their side protection. So, going into that, right about that period, um, and also in the later vessels, which ended up being uh, the Sushi Aobuff and the Miyoko class, after Miyoko going into Takao, Takao is still using a lot of the New Vickers Not Cemented. However, at the dates that they were being produced, there's a lot of speculation, even though it's not listed in any actual source. There's been a lot of speculation that most of their horizontal protection most likely was CNC armor because the CNC plates were first being developed uh, right around 1930 and 31 as these ships were being produced. Now, they were for certain used in Mogami and also in other forms. But also at the same time, there was a lot of experimentation using um, standard manganese steel, which is Ducal steel, or uh, steel type D, which was a structural steel, but it was a high-grade car uh, carbon alloy steel for armor protection. But going into 1931, the CNC plates, they began experimental uh, experimental plate design. They tested ballistically, because what they're trying to check was the scale. So it started with, I want to do it an inch platform, because at the time there was some in millimeters, some in inch platform. So you're going everywhere between 1.4 inches, uh, 1.7, two and a half inches, 3.9, which is 100 millimeters, and 8.5 inches. Um, the main thing that we're testing was is how they compared to their new bigger non-cemented plates. What they found is that in scaling from 100 millimeters on down, they were 
almost exactly equivalent, in some cases superior to the new vigor down cemented, especially in the 35 to 40 millimeter range. They were found to be superior to, to new vigor down cemented. However, once it went beyond that, the scale effects show that new vigor down cemented performed better. So what they ended up doing um, for a margin of safety, they decided to adopt for armor under 75 millimeters that keep it uh, as CNC. However, in some cases, it was taken all over to 100 millimeters. And that's just because of tapered plates. There was a little bit in between and they just let us pass on that. So... Going into 1937, this is when they start looking at heavy armor production again. And by heavy armor, I mean anything over 8 inches. And this is also when they had pulled out of all the treaties. Now, there is not any listing through Mitsubishi, uh, Kurei, Naval Guard, any others that they had produced any other heavy plates before this other than two plates of 12... Oh, excuse me, 12 inch outside of the upgrades they were doing to the Nagato classes mm -hmm. when they were doing major rebuilds. Most of the plates they were doing for the upgrades on them, however, were not cemented. Okay. The, there, the exception, and there's been speculation because there hasn't been any records found of this, the turret faces and turret armor upgrades. Now, every, we know in documents that they used turrets that were uh, planned for the Tosa class as well as the subsequent um, key class. But the thickness of the turrets, of the armor on the turrets, did not match original plans. So it's unknown whether or not that armor was already made due to speculation for those two classes and it was just put in storage or if it was made at that time. And the reason why this is a, you know, a big thing is that the turret faces were right at 46 centimeters or a little over 18 inches. That's a thick face. And it's hardened. So if that was made after the 1926 era, which was uh, the first experimental 18-inch Vickers cement plate that was made in Japan, they did, however, make plates as heavy as 26 inches at that time in 1926. Oh, wow. All of them failed. Yeah. That's All of them failed. Um, at least in the hardened point, the non-hardened plates were fine. So they did some experimentation. Mind you, 1926 was, was literally in the middle of their, their, their revolution. So industrial revolution, I would pretty much call it, or their golden age. Uh, German was in the same age as well, but all development. So the other thing they went to in 1920 was tapering the plates. This was something that all nations started doing of... And this was a big thing going on with the U.S. and Britain and Japan all in particular because if you could taper the plate, you can cut off, you can shave weight off without having to do stepped plates uh, down through the design. Now, so you're looking at 1926, unless we can prove that they developed the plates for the rebuilds of the Nagatos because that was done around 33 through 36. You get back to 1937 that they come in to look at the development of Vickers Hardened. Vickers Hardened was designed for the following reasons. To eliminate fuel consumption using carburizing. To eliminate carburizing materials. To increase shop capacity. To decrease the time cycle for production. To permit plates which had certain types of defects such as flaking. Now, there's no what flaking is. Basically, when you're trying to harden the armor, if it begins to flake, it'll cause uh, microscopic cracks. So, basically, expand during the hardening process or cause fissures. 
this you tr want to avoid this because it can cause basically crystalline fracture. So if you take a hit in that point, it'll cause that plate to fail right there, creating a crack all the way through the plate. So for those, what they were want to do is be able to re-roll them into thinner plates that will basically fuse those cracks back in and can be used as a homogeneous non-cemented plate. And the last point was to prevent or lessen the susceptibility of surface cracking after face hardening. Again, the flaking issue. So the, the reason why I list at the top on down that order was that was the exact order that the Japanese listed this as. And it's also replaced uh, in the U.S. Senate Commission of Japan. The biggest one was to eliminate fuel consumption using carburizing. Mm -hmm. It was expensive to make steel. It was even more expensive to make hardened steel because of all the processes made. Now, for those of you out there who like watching any sort of channel, them making swords and such, because I actually apprenticed that as a kid, you have to harden, treat, reharden, and normalize for a lot of different types of steels. Or you have to do one of the processes. You might just do a quench and normalize. You might do a, uh, a quench, harden, requench and then normalize depending on what kind of structure you, uh, through marcinite and other factors you might do a different set of process all of this costs fuel and based on how big these plates are that means hours to days in a furnace to get the temperature up right yeah because you need it evenly across this plate so they were looking for a way to cut down fuel consumption now as you and I were speaking earlier, no one else got to hear about this. The main thing that Japan, U.S. Mail, started testing and, and the experimental plates by 1926 started to show, the cemented layer had become worthless. The new capped rounds that were out there completely negated the need for a cemented layer. It offered no additional protection, and they found that the actual hardened back layer was what was doing all the actual protecting. So eliminate the, the actual f process of carburizing the face after face hardening, they could save time because carburizing that face costs a lot of fuel. So that was the first thing they did to eliminate that. And that was the number two step to eliminate carburizing materials. That was the cemented layer. To increase shop capacity, this was done because it takes less time to just make a face hard in armor versus cemented, yep. which means they could produce more armor for a shorter period of time. Now, in the fourth part, they say to decrease the time cycle for production. One thing that a lot of people don't know about this, and this is something that's done of everyone, and I've, honestly, I can't remember if this was something developed by Krupp directly. Um, or if it was just something universal before that with the Harvey Steel development process. But whenever you make face hardened or cemented plates, they would weather them. And this sounds a little weird. Basically what they would do is after it was produced, for a few months, it would be left to weather in the elements. Now this weathering process allowed it to settle and they would be able to see cracks and or deficiency form better because a slight bit of oxidizing was fine because they can just remove it but it gave them time to look for any sort of impurity that can cause a plate failure so there's a reason why this was done and part of it was just the fact that if they could take that extra time to look for this and allow it to weather through it greatly reduced the chance of them putting this plate on a ship and it fell in under Odd conditions. So when they first started testing the Vickers Smith versus Vickers Hardened, they would they made comparable plates, uh, nineteen thirty seven. So they made at this time two thicknesses. It was of, and this actually was done in a inch category. It was done at thirteen inches. The reason why was because they were using older Vickers cemented plates they had on hand, which was still done in the inch of. Uh, spectrum because before they moved to the symmetric system in 17 inches. So they actually tested them with the uh, on hand 16, well, 
technically 41 centimeter guns, just how they actually uh, resisted the actual pressure of the projectiles and or naval limits and post penetration damage of the shells. They found that in the grade of thir- at the 13 inch grade, there was no inf- there was no in- advantage whatsoever of cementing the face. On the 17 inch, there was a one to two percent um, difference in favor of the cemented side. However, they couldn't really find whether or not that was just you know one two percent margin of error, or if it was actually something to do with the plates. So, because of this, they decided to move forward on making just these bigger hardened plates. Now, Japan saw this as a stopgap measure. They had always planned to produce better armor, but this alone would allow them to produce plates of the same quality, almost actually quality, probably the best way to put it, of the same resistance factor or ballistic resistance as the Vicar cemented for about 70% of the cost. Mm-hmm. And when you're making a large battleship, that's a bit of, that's quite a bit of cost savings. Yeah. Uh, like uh, Lenger and Alberg kind of summed this up basically as Vickers Hardened was adopted for, quote, economic rather than ballistic reasons, uh, end quote. And it really was. Yeah. It makes perfect sense because, you know, you can, t- you can theory craft about having a, a much better plate down the line, but the thing is, if nobody's going to give you the budget for it, if you can't get the raw materials for it, you don't have any armor plate. So, <laughs> Yes, and at this time, uh, Japan was well aware of how obsolete their capital ships were. Mm-hmm. Uh, they knew this way beyond, which is one of the main reasons why uh, – they were pushing to get replacements over many of the other nations. Uh, Britain was alongside them a bit. However, Japan was laying down and launching their ships that they were keeping at the time as late as 1913. So much development had occurred in the period of 1940 to 1918 in naval design that the only two ships that they felt comfortable keeping was Nagato and Mutsu because of the developments that they took in place. And even they were deficient after the Battle of Jutlands mm-hmm. showed them a lot of weaknesses that they needed to be worked on. Um, Haraga actually wanted to completely stop the production of Mutsu and incorporate his designs. Uh, he actually completely uh, blueprint drafted. He could actually work a, th- a fifth turret on there. And with newer developments in boiler technology they had developed with all oil-based boilers getting rid of all the coal, shorten it down slightly at the exact same weight amount and get better armor protection. Mm-hmm. Now, they would not do this because they were like, we've already set the budget. You said it's going to increase the budget slightly for us to do this. We're broke. <laughs> so, we, I mean, literally the reason why they fought about the Washington Naval Street and not getting rid of the Mutsu is because they took donations to finish building the ship. Mm-hmm. school children literally basically paid war bonds to get this ship built they're like listen um, we can't give you the funding so tough luck yeah one anecdote about that is um, one of the sh- one of the battleships they ended up scrapping I can't remember which one it was but as a result of the treaties they had uh, they ha- actually had full basically funeral rites for it um, there was a lot of emotional attachment to warships that I think it's hard for a, mod- a modern uh, person to understand because it doesn't seem to have that same weight anymore as it did back in the kind of the earlier 20th century. It's because there were, I guess you think about it, you know, when you think about the idea of the capital ship, this behemoth basically visualized industrial superiority. Mm hmm. So, I mean, if you think about like a nation like Japan, uh, there was only about 12 nations in the world that had battleships. Only about six had ships of that size. So, and honestly, we want to go into the Tosa, which was one of them they did, they ended up having a scrap. And it was the one they did uh, ballistic testing against before as a target. It was pretty much completed. I mean, if we want to be completely honest, 
Uh, there's a reason why Kaga, its sister ship, was used as a carrier when because of the earthquake damaging uh, Amagi's hull too much. That's why it was a Kagi and uh, Kaga being used. But these were huge ships. They were expensive. They basically were your way of projecting power and just like today being carriers. That basically proved to the world that you're a force to be reckoned with. However, with Japan, it's, you know, same thing with England in a sense, them being island-based nations, they have a bigger thing about the sea, but with Japan even more so because of Shintoism and their birth of Japan, uh, with Shinto being the sword being dipped and the two drop and the drop was forming the islands, their creation story literally revolves around the ocean. Mm-hmm. So, to them, it is their way of life. So, which is kind of funny if you think about the fact that Japan we didn't have much of a navy for the longest time, yeah. even though they're so attached to it. Of whereas you look at like the ancient Korean kingdoms and their relate their reliance on the navy ocean going vessels and such and then it, it's, it is a bit funny if you look back at it however they have, they have much reverence at the sea although I will say this much and this is not a very well known fact before the Tokugawa government shut down Japan on um, international relations Japan had actually built a galleon and they had a foreign ambassador who sailed all the way across the Pacific landed near i think it was like near mexico he crossed over the ship stayed there he crossed over mexico a portuguese delegation took him to portugal he went through spain met the pope there's actually a painting of him you know you know in rome him meeting them i actually forgot the gentleman's name i would probably have to go look up for another video sometime did a loop around came all the way back towards um south america Got back on his ship. I believe he sailed towards the South Indies and then went back up near China and then back to Japan. It was about an eight-year trip. <laughs> and after that, they were like, yep, yeah, so because of Christianity, cut off all ties except for a uh, – well, initially it was locked off to Nagasaki and a small flotilla island with the – uh, Dutch, however, that's either here or there. But it does kind of show that for a short period, Japan did kind of modernize, and then they immediately receded back. However, going into the few into the modern era, they did very much modernize. So, yeah, going back into the whole of uh, burial rites and or funeral rites, I think a lot of that goes back to Shintoism with development of weapons and their swords they always had uh, Shinto rights done whenever they produce a sword and if they had to destroy one they also had a right for that too so I think a lot of that had to do with Shinto as a whole that they were basically because in a sense of uh, with Kami or in this case you know spirits it had its own spirit so they had to basically cleanse it it's just something that even modern Japanese today would think, what? It's, it's something that kind of fell away, that it isn't really spoken about much anymore, that I would also have to look into because a lot of this just isn't practiced anymore. It's, it's old. Mm-hmm. Um, I do know they still do a, a Shinto ceremony for the launching vessels now, but I've never heard of them doing it for decommissioning vessels. It just basically is brought into port, thrown in a dry dock, and they go, they get, they go to work, they got some grinders, it's, it's go time. But yeah, they, they took it the worst on that because all of their older ships were in, they knew just how bad off they really were. They were modernizing them because that's all they could do. But in 1937, they wanted to very rapidly replace these ships. Uh, especially the Ise class because as ironic enough as it is, they, they trucked the three sets of twin turrets to get better firing angles. Every sailor and the Navy hated those ships. <laughs> they had the least amount of living space for the crew because they had to lose a lot of top deck space uh, for the design. 
They also have enough depth to for the third modernization to get better elevation on the gun. So some of the guns can elevate, I believe, uh, beyond 25 degrees. This is a huge issue. Hence why they're immediately regulated to rear area. Uh, they'd actually debated for the longest time just laying out all the turrets and just convert them over to carriers. Because it's sort of length uh, and the width ratio would be good for a carrier. But they wanted to replace these ships. The Congos were kept out of necessity because they were the only ships they had that were fast. Technically... Nagato and Mutsu were until the final, the last modernization, which all the added weight, upgrading all the armor to make them, because they'll basically they're like, listen, we need something that can handle the frontline stuff. We know what these other nations are developing. We know that the ship can't take a hit in these sort of types of categories without the separated armor. But you're looking at 12,000 tons of added weight. That's a lot of weight. So the fact they were saying we were to hit about 25 and a half knots from the original 27 knots was still pretty reasonable. But it wasn't anywhere near Congo's 30 knots. Mm-hmm. And they needed it to be able to keep up with their new carrier force. So the Congos were basically shoehorned into a job that they were not very well suited for. Mm-hmm. And even they were wanting to be replaced. So with all that in mind with armor development... They began developing these armors. Now, it wasn't until 1940, once they had produced enough other more into development, that the MNC plates were made. Now, these are the molybdenum of non cemented plates. They were superior to New Vickers non cemented. They were slight, actually, well, if I'm going to be honest, the Old specification of STS steel, they were actually on par with it. Um, there's been a lot of debate. Um, I know Nathan Oaken, uh, he's a, a very famous, uh, within the naval community, uh, armor analyst, has looked into it. But there's been speculation that the Japanese might have gotten the idea from plates they imported from Germany uh, because they did import plates in for uh, testing on of horizontal bombing runs before the uh, Pearl Harbor attack, but they were doing this uh, more than a year in advance on testing. However, that doesn't really correlate because when the plates were ordered and shipped, it does not meet the time that they could have tested those plates, produced their own plates, and fit them on Yamato. But there's been speculation because there were observers at the plant that the Japanese might have gotten the specifications and started trying to produce their own while they were waiting on those plates to come in. So that one could have been the case, but there is no proof on that. So in 1940, they began developing these plates, and they were looking for, in this case, their, their first step of a superior plate to replace non, uh, new figures not cemented. Uh, it was found to be less susceptible to a grain fracture under severe impact, which was a big thing, because that meant that it didn't create as much spalling on the back end where it took a hit. And that was great because that also meant critical failure of a plate completely just breaking in. So besides that from 1940 uh, to 1945, most of their development at this point was conservation because as the war progressed on, they were looking for ways to save on rare metals. The exception of that was two experimental plates that the U.S. and British tested. That were some of the best uh, face hardened plates I'd ever tested at that time, yeah. and up to this day. And neither the U.S. nor Britain were able to reproduce these plates, so we're not exactly sure how they made them. Uh, so, speculated that they uh, used new Krupp manufacturing processes with their own know-how of developing the, their own hardened armor, but we're not completely sure on that. And I'll go into those in a little bit, but I want to go into uh, 1942 first. Uh, 1942, they again began testing out different amounts of uh, additional copper. They found that none of the analysis that anything over uh, 100 millimeters was satisfactory. Yet again, they were like, they went back to the original 75 and below. Plates of, uh, what's based on a CNC1. I just want to sound really weird because it's going to go from CNC, CNC1, CNC2. Basically, for those who are listening, it just means they kept adding more and more copper. So for CNC, 
which is just a copper and cemented base. The amount of copper was between, let's see here. Uh, I mean, it was about 0.9 to 1%. And then going into CNC1, what they began doing was leaving the copper more or less the same. And they did begin adding uh, a little bit of, of molybdenum to this blend. It was a very slight amount, it was about 0.1 to 0.2%. And the copper could adjust about 0.1 to 0.2%, uh, either plus or minus. But they were reducing the copper from, where was it, 2.5 to 1.8. And the chromium actually had to be increased slightly because they had a little more chromium supply than they did copper, at the, uh, not copper, but uh, nickel at the time. And this was tested because of chromium's ability to make something a little more uh, tougher than nickel if it was substituted. So they found that they could substitute more nickel with, uh, in this process up to a certain degree. Uh, CNC2 was another step adding even more or in this case, we're adding more, but removing more nickel. They ended up removing about 0.5 additional nickel. And they found that with the following steps, you got this. So for CNC1, uh, equivalent, same before 1.42 inch and, and 3.9 was 100 millimeters. Gauge were ballistically equivalent to CNC plates. So you could remove this amount and it was exact, pretty much the exact same. On the CNC2 plates, uh, the 1.42 inch gauges were ballistically equivalent. However, going beyond 2 inches, it became, the, the apex began to dive down. So it became inferior. So what ended up happening was to save on more strategic reserves for the smaller, thinner CNC plates, they began using the CNC2 model. Now, there was a further test conducted known as CNC3. Um, and here's a funny thing. So they were using so much copper to save nickel and other platforms that in 1943, they actually started running out of copper. So they started looking for ways to reduce the copper content. And what they ended up doing was, uh, they held the nickel percentage back as well as carbon percentage to only about 0.8%. And began to substitute more molybdenum. However, they found that they really couldn't go above about an inch or 25.4 millimeters before it started to cause problems. So that was mostly saved for very specific uses. Uh, their, de their refining and or their development uh, for their melting so what Japan did, as I was saying earlier, they had one steel manufacturer. They would basically get all their ingots from both these uh, central uses or developers and producers. So all armor steel is made in the uh, in most in open in an acid open hearth. Uh, uh, for heavy plates, it will sometimes they sort of use uh, three furnaces to fill up one mold. Basically, you would have three furnaces, and they would uh, for casting all through to pour into the one mold and then from there you take the plate out and either roll it or just keep it as is based on how big or thick it is. Japan did have a 50,000 ton press for pressing plates. Most pressing was only done on plates of about 8 inches and below. Anything beyond that, if they did do a press on it, it was for squaring and or for rolling. Most in this case, basically making tapered plates. So they would basically put a wedge and they would try to press it in and then they'd roll it to try to get the taper better. Uh, their largest furnaces had a capacity of about 70 tons. And a lot of it was, of course, uh, they would basically just use the, the uh, scrap ingots, which are the ones produced locally. Now, when you hear 70 tons, let that set in for a moment. They had about... Six, well, Curry Naval Yard had 16 furnaces. That's 70 tons each. That ship came in empty at about 62,000 tons. About 59,000 of that steel. 
that's a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, most of their molds were top frame mold. Uh, it was a big end up. And around, of course, a slight taper. This made it, well, for people to ask why they always had rounded edges, um, rounded edges don't create a weak point. On plates, if they're squared off, the square is actually a weak point. Because in steel, when you're manufacturing steel, it has a thing called shrinkage. Or, uh, actually, what's the new modern term for that? So I don't think shrinkage is used anymore. Okay, so it is, per, it is percent reduced area. Okay. Oh, uh, percent reduced so, area. Okay. Yeah. So it is still the same. Okay. Uh, just, so it gets called different things at different times. So it is percent reduced area. Uh, there's also uh, elongation ratio. But the thing with reduced area is that if it has a square edge, when it wants to reduce or when it cools, it basically contracts. Cracks and or flaking likes to form at those at, at, uh, straight edges. So they almost always round them slightly mm-hmm. um, just because rounded edges are stronger in that point which it's funny because a lot of people when you see them when they put like best example you'll look at say like the king george five class with the british and you see that are like squared they have hard edges. same thing if you go look at um, the bismarck you see like they're nice squared plates they're square post processing and post weathering but when they're when they're being cold they have to keep the edges rounded They'll just go back later and they'll uh, they'll grind them with a uh, a water grind to keep it cool so it doesn't cause any uh, post breaking or they'll cut it by using a way of cooling it so it doesn't cause any heat damage to the actual face. But that's the main reason why they actually would uh, have rounded edges. So the average pour or uh, dimension was used about 125 tons. Um, all ingots and or all uh, molds that were formed were also stamped. Uh, I mean, that's commonplace for any manufacturer. That way you could check by batch. If a, one batch was bad, you can go back and pull that full batch from that pour yeah. and make sure your quality control is going on with that. So starting in 1920, um, they call them heats or how many uh, pours were made. The, it's sort of about 37,000. By 25, the average is about 39,500. By 1930, it went up to 42,000. Uh, it kind of stagnated a bit. It stayed about that area for a while. 35, it actually went to 47. While well, this was the new development of destroyers and cruisers. In 1940, it went up to 53,500. This also includes the, what, the new development of their new carrier program. And through... 41 and 42, and by 54 and 56,000. So it was ramping up. And actually, it ended up peaking at 62,000 by 1945. So they were still producing a lot of steel. It's just, it was of lower quality because at this point, they were actually making more things such as uh, high tensile steel. A lot of their later escort vessels were basically going from duco steel to straight back to high tensile steel because they can it's just carbon steel all you need is just steel and carbon it's not an alloy it's easy for them to either rivet or weld and they can mass produce it so they were going balls to the wall just trying to get as much of it produced to get out there to stem the tide but mind you this steel wasn't just being used for that it was used for a lot of other uh, factors as well uh, especially for aircraft design because they use steel and aluminum so, for operations, for any plate that was 8.7 inches and under, it was rolled. Anything over 8.7, it was what's called rough forging. Basically, it was cast. And then they would um, partially roll. Most of the rolling was basically to square it up because a cast wasn't always perfect, especially when they had the uh, heat reduction. Uh, to go through a process of how long it's... And mind you, this is for Vickers Harden plates. Um, I think I have the timetable for Vickers Cemented. But for a... So this is for a 420 millimeter... Oh, God, 420. Uh, or 16.5 inch plate. Uh, the slab weighed approximately 100 tons. After cropping, it was approximately... in. Sorry, people, this one's going to be in inches just because... 
a lot of their dimensions. For whatever reason, they went to metric. These are exactly inch dimensions, which tells me that even though they went to metric, they were still using inches on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. 75 inches by 112 inches by 85 inches. Um, the latter figure being the ingot length and the forging direction. Um, there were heat in a producer gas fired furnace, as for all below, and for 32 hours, and mind you, this will be in metric, it's in 1200 Celsius, was held there for 10 to 15 hours. Um, the difference in from 10 to 15, a lot of it had to do with humidity and different po uh, points in the year based on uh, that factor, and or also location too. Uh, it was then pressed from 75 inches down to 61 inches, and then a second press, remember I was talking about that, that huge 50,000 ton press, that was, this is what that part was used for. Um, it was then heated again for 25 hours, again at 1200 Celsius. It was, it was, on, it was held there for 8 to 10 hours. They then press it down to 43.5 inches. They then heated it uh, for 20 hours, 1200 again, and held it for 8 hours. They then rolled it to 33.5 inches. Roughly is 181 inches wide. It was re-rolled then down to 23.5 inches. And then there was a relief heat for 28 hours at 650 Celsius. Now, this relief heat was basically normalizing the plate so that it wouldn't cause any stress fractures. It was then held again, an air cold. Then it was reheated up to 28 hours at 650 and then reheld at 30 hours to air cool. It was skeleton scarf. This is basically them going through and uh, scraping away any slag. Uh, if you've ever seen uh, anyone hammering steel and like videos and stuff, you'll see the carburized uh, facing peeling off that slag material. You want to scrape all that off for any, any in between presses because that will push impurities back into your metal. Uh, that actual slag, which we don't know, that's actually uh, oxide or rust. Um, when, a, when a steel is heated up to that temperature, it immediately oxidizes with the atmosphere. That's so why you're constantly removing that flux. So after that point, they then reheat it for 25 hours at 1200. They hold it for eight hours. They then roll it down to its, its actual thickness of 16.5 inches. In this case, it'll be 161 inches wide and exactly 256 inches long. This plate were to have been a bigger cemented, and here's the part adds in, an extra half inch of thickness would have been allowed. It is then put into a relief heat in, uh, for 20 hours at 650. It's held at 20 hours and then air-cooled. If they're going to cement it, there would be another step, which would add in another 28 hours of cementing, 30 hours of cooling, and then reheating. That whole process takes roughly a week and a half for one plate and is very obviously labor intensive and yes you could obviously you know you going through this it's like yeah i think this will get to people that like this wasn't you know producing these armor plates wasn't just you melt some metal you pour it into a mold you let it cool and then you slap it on the side of a ship you needed people that knew what they were doing you needed the science to back them up and yeah you can see why um, this was such a massive industrial endeavor for uh, various nations. Yes. Now, mind you, this is before they even carburize it to give the actual face harden point. Mm -hmm. And I said about the part about the bigger cemented because that would be added after this next step I'm going to go over next. Now, let's talk about the, the 50,000 ton hydraulic press. They had others, but the, that was the heaviest one. And that was the one most at the current naval yard for big plates. They only had one. Well, with that said, everybody, they had one. They only had one because they were going to buy three more, but that recession, that scrapped that whole plan. Uh, if I remember correctly, that press was actually made here in the United States. The uh, Their rolling was accomplished by two 9,000 horsepower mills. Uh, one unit was actually made in England uh, by... Uh, Davy Rose, I'm not sure who they are today. Um, it had a 48 inch diameter roller. They were uh, 11 feet 10 inches long. The other unit was actually copied and produced in Japan 
had 48 inch rolls, but there were it was 20 points how inches long so that they can do more plates at once. Uh, they were actually ran by reciprocating steam engines. So think of those old reciprocating engines you see like in World War I and before, like the Titanic. That's what they use to run these. So after all that's done, uh, that plate above, you end up with a plate that's give or take about 420 inches and 161 inches wide and 256 inches long. Now, you got to go to the carburization. So the vigorous hardening are non-cemented. However, they, they were carburized. So two plates are arranged face-to-face. -face. And the reason I did this is so they can just do two plates at once with the uh, gas running through. Carburizing mixture sandwiched between them. The upper plate supported by a set of angle bars uh, to hold it up there. And it was also supported in such a way that it would confine the gases. The mixture consists of three layers from top to bottom as follows. A 3 8 inch to 1 half inch of bone ash. 2 and 1 4 inch to 2 and a half inch of charcoal. And 3 8 inches to 1 half inch of bone ash for total being approximately 3 inches. Now, that's how they did the cementing. That's a lot of material for, for doing a cement layer. Now that, that furnace was fired and over the gas that we usually had about 930 to 900 Celsius for two to seven days. Depending on how thick your plate was and how well it was actually carburizing and forming that layer, it could take a full seven days. Mind you, that's seven days if you have to constantly pump heat and that's a lot of fuel. And also depending on the quality of the compound being used. So the main reason why they wanted to get rid of this, this that whole process, is it ate up so much fuel and they thought it just didn't really do much at that point. So doing uh, from testing, they were like, let's just get rid of this whole process. It's it's not working. It, it's It takes so much extra time, fuel, man hours. Because mind you, that's one of that's that's literally three crews because at that time, well actually, excuse me, it was two crews because they, they were 12 hour shifts at this time of running around the clock. And the plates were not hoarded any matter after carburizing. So if you if you screw up that carburizing process, that plate was ruined. Oh man. Whereas the Vickers Harden plate, if they if it carburized and it it had messed up, they would go back and re-roll it and um roll on that carbon layer that was uh Cause it to harden, and they would basically just roll it out to a thinner, non uh, new figures, non cemented, and or they would recycle it because you can actually recycle that face hardened plate far easier than you can cemented because mm -hmm. you have to cut the entire cemented layer off. So, heat treatment for the Vickers hardened, they would treat it. Let's see. All right. So depending on the the thickness, this is the thickness set for the quench heating. It was heated up between 840 to 860 Celsius. If it was one inch and below, it was heated for five hours and held for four hours. Now, this is basically what we call a hybrid quench. It's held and then it's quenched. And for this reason, it's so it basically slowly cools down. And the reason why they're doing that is that they're trying to increase the depth of hardness, not at the face, but slightly inside the armor. So at the 10 inch range, which is 25.4 centimeters for those of you out there in metric, was held for 10 hours or heated for 10 hours and held at eight hours. For that 42 centimeter plate I was speaking of earlier, that's heating for 22 hours and held at 20 hours. So the thicker the plate, the longer it took. The temper, which is post quench temper, for the same exact size as one inch was six hours heating, five hours holding, for the 10, 12 heating, 10 holding, so that's it costing more time. However, the 42 centimeter was 18 to 20 for heating and 16 to 18 holding. And that temper was done at a 640 to 670 Celsius. If I didn't say that before, I don't remember if I did or not. Now, the quenching process itself between those two steps was done with something called, oh my, man, he's going to get demonetized because this is actually what the stuff is called. It's called rape seed oil. Mm. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> Sorry, the, the bots are going to demonetize that. 
I mean, it literally is called rapeseed. I mean, it's a vegetable oil, but it's, yeah. Uh, it's a, it, based for the one what that is, it's what canola oil was called before it was, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's a vegetable oil. So they, it was basically sprayed on there. And then after cold, it would then be uh, tempered by water spray cooling. The quenching in oil in the heavier plates resulted, of course, in the formation of what's known as bainite in the middle plate. Bainite was not particularly objectionable, but upper bainite um, is what caused that brittle issue. Uh, the Japanese translated this deficiency as, as um, shurome, which is temper brittleness. So now plates at a certain thickness, there was very little of it, so it wasn't a problem. But Say like the Ishitomo Yamato's uh, face plates, with how thick they were, that became a problem because it couldn't properly quench or cool the inside at the right rate, so it caused this to form in large amounts. Mm. Uh, and to be honest, uh, a lot of people say, "Oh, well, the U.S. can do that." Actually, the U.S. ran the same problem too over certain thicknesses with face hardened. Hence why the face plates of the Iowa is actually world homogenous steel. It's not face hardened. We ran into the same problem. We actually, I believe we cut off, our cutoff point was 14 inches for face, or for hardened cemented armors because of that problem. Uh, today, we actually know better ways of, of cooling that, but at the time, it was an issue. However, the Japanese... Um, had no way to get around this, so they end up just dealing with it, so to speak. Uh, for armor thicknesses under two inches, they were just oil quench, and then uh, and then either once or twice tempered. Two to eight inches, or I should say over two inches up to eight inches, they were oil quenched, tempered, oil quenched, um, re-tempered, and then they were twice tempered over after that. Over eight inches. Oil quench, tempered, retempered, oil quench, rectify, tempered, retempered, and if it was over 50 more inches, they retempered it again to try to reduce the formation of that upper bainite. So, what we're looking for is marcenite. Marcenite is pretty much what they're going for. It gets a good crystalline structure, it gets good hardness, it's a little bit ductile, it doesn't shatter near, uh, anywhere near as much. That's what they're aiming for. Problem is, the formation of marcenite. If it's not cold and set crystallized immediately, bainite forms. And that's what makes it brittle. Of uh, so I made a comment rectified and tempered. For those people who don't know, when you quench a plate, it likes to bend. So the retempering was them actually straightening the plates back out as they're quenching, and they were basically trying to keep it from crowning, or if you don't know the term crowning, bowing. After that process is all done, they would uh, cut a section, or they would usually maybe possibly uh, take a core out of certain samples that would make more than one plate, and they would do the same uh, batch and test that batch. And if it met the require the quality control requirements, that batch is passed on. They didn't do it for every plate because it was time consuming, but they did it per batch. Now, that treatment process was for uh, also the homogenous plates. If it passed that point, it was done. Face hardening, we got another step to go through. <laughs> you guys thought I, we were done. <laughs> so they had a Simmons German uh, reverberary furnace uh, where basically it, with a, it did producer gas, uh, methane, natural gases, and the like. It's very much wanted because they perforated carbon monoxide or if they needed to, they could just directly uh, input CO2 post burn. So they were, uh, the heat treated plate was face face up on the bed of wet sand or roughly the same thickness as the plate. Uh, this sand and the plate were insulated with fire brick. This is basically to keep the layer of gas only hitting the face. And also, instantly, um, I should note that there's been a lot of speculation that what they did to change the experimental plates is they believe they use wet clay. Um, that was a technique they've used for centuries in Japan. It's just it's a lot of clay, and for an experimental plate, it may, 
you can easily come up with that amount. Um, <clears throat> and the reason why they believe that's because of uh, certain colorations on the plate during testing. So after that was done, um, thermocouples were set in. Uh, one was secured to the face of the plate, and the other inserted into the hole through the back of the plate, and it, it extended 100 percent through the plate's thickness. This is so they could test the uh, carbon penetration. Uh, mind you, this hole was usually a bolt fixing hole to the be applied to the ship when it was bolted on, so it wasn't much of a problem. They were going to use a a nickel steel bolt that's designed to shear or uh, bend instead of easily breaking. So that hole is already going to be placed in the plate to begin with. First, brought up to between 1100 to 1150 Celsius. It was in charge of. Uh, and further heating was applied as rapidly as the furnace construction permitted. They wanted to bring the heat up as quickly as possible. Uh, the plate was removed when the interior of the thermocouple were inserted at 730 Celsius. So the one that they placed in the hole, at which time the face had reached at about 850 Celsius. The plate was immediately water sprayed front and back. This created a shore hardness of... Depending between at the very front of the face at about 75 to 80, and it basically uh, gradually increased by about five beyond that before it went into a chill or a percent factor of about 35 percent of the depth of the plate. Then it went back to the softer back layer of the armor. So the desired depth of chill is determined uh, at the, what's considered the 42 shore hardness uh, factor, which is basically the mid or back part of the plate was 30 to 33% for production armor. Some general plates made with chills, as I said earlier, up to 40%. Plates intended for face hardening were charged with a concave curve, so the quench would result in a more flat surface. So they would purposely crown the ones that they were actually going to face harden. That way when it quenched, it would want to snap itself back straight. Or they would do this, like say, rounded areas on a ship, uh, like the Yamato, you notice that they had a lot of angled points, they would creatively adjust that to try to get to uh, either bend itself or flatten itself out. And honestly, it was an art in its own for people who are making these plates, which is why even today, it's hard for people to try to reproduce them. So once you've actually fixed, you know, say a piece of VH to say Yamato, what was kind of the, the ballistic performance of these plates or their resistance to projectiles, I should say? All right, let me pull that up for you. If I remember right from the... Um, I think I pulled that from the uh, U.S. Navy technical mission. It said it was about like 83% strength of... eighty. Well, on average, 84 to 88%. Okay. Uh, depending on the thickness of the armor. Okay. Um, they found it to be of comparable level to their... To the armor they had on the U.S. standards, mm -hmm. uh, which is about that same quality level. However, their newer ships were far beyond that. They also said that they found when they did core samples and of uh, V Sharpie test that, as well as microscopic uh, examination, that it had a little bit, or I'll say, it was considered dirty, or I mean, it had more post-processing material that wasn't removed. Uh, this being silicon and manganese processing, which basically pulls out the slag. Of, however, it was still within acceptable those parameters what they considered for the old World War One plates. Which, when they spoke to the Ash Developers Armor, stated that that's exactly what they were going for. It was cheaper. They were like, "Well, then, if that's what they're going for, it makes sense. There's no problem." Mm -hmm. So. Now, the one plate I want to talk about, uh, which I actually have the, the full parameters of the testing on, which I am going to hand over for to be posted on the YouTube video, of uh, one in particular that was talked about was a experimental plate of 7.6 inches or exactly uh, 193 millimeters. Oh, excuse me, that was the Carnegie method. The Japanese developed one that was 7.21 inches 
let's see what's that millimeters right at one so it was right at 183 millimeters so what they had managed to do was they actually that piece of armor exceeded u.s face hardened armors by about nine percent they actually took a piece of experimental uh, crumb cemented uh, NA that was about 7.28 inches and found that it was slightly inferior to that plate, but very close. Uh, both of them had different scaling results. And it actually completely baffled the U.S. mission because when they actually uh, did core sampling and Microsoft anali analysis, it was the same dirty type. As the, ones, as the previous ones, but it was performing much better. And the biggest thing is that it was performing so well that so the U.S. were firing at this, their new super hard cat, which is about 680 Brunel all the way through, Mark 21 mod 5A projectiles to completely penetrate the plate in effective condition. Um, the older mod 3 projectiles, similar but with a max counter, was about 580, were torn up so bad when they completely penetrated, that was an extremely rare feat for those projectiles, that they failed and were not able to post uh, detonate. So they failed the, na the uh, navy limit on it. So the U.S. were extremely impressed by this plate, and to be honest, so much so that in their own uh, analysis for the naval mission to Japan, they even stated that it brings into question um, some of their own. Uh, prejudices of what it should be and how it should work or how a plate should be made because if that, they were to do that with that dirty plate it brings into consideration some things mm -hmm. that they weren't really looking into uh, i'm gonna look for the exact quote right now when they spoke about that plate i actually will give everyone the plate number as well if i don't have it in this document i do have the naval yard testing ballistic test documents I just want to pull that one up because I know I have the plate number and everything in that one. Okay. U.S. Naval Armor Test, U.S. Naval Proving Ground. For those of you who want to find it online, it's report number 5, TAC 47. It is actually, uh, or you can look for NPG report number 5, TAC 47. It actually has the full report of them testing these plates. Uh, this also includes the, uh, the things we were talking about earlier about the resistance has versus our own so the way they tested this is it mind you the the plate that completely impressed them was plate five zero tac three one three three you know idea of how well this thing performed so there's not something else a ballistic limit and this ballistic limit to explain what that is i'll actually read directly from the report all right that two page is like to read so the ballistic limit is per per thousand basically psi or in this case of uh, pound squared so the ballistic limit uh, on average for, for that plate was seven and one uh, quarter inches or 7.25 inches it was actually really 7.21 but they rounded off for the, the document uh, the estimated ballistic limit of this was 118 plus or minus 1,000. U.S. average was 112.8. Uh, that was when being struck by an 8-inch uh, Mark 21 TAC-3 at 30 degrees against the uh, 21 TAC-5, which is an extreme... They were called the unbreakable projectiles. They were so well made. Uh, to be honest, the U.S. had made some of the best projectiles in the world. They, they surpassed Krupp, the British, everyone at this point. The you know, others were making, might have been making better armor, but U.S. made the best projectiles at that point. Uh, so much so that the Lion class, the British were looking at buying U.S. made 16-inch uh, shells for it. Uh, the 8-inch uh, 21 TAC-5 at 30 degrees against the plate was 110 to 111,000, and the U.S. average was 109.7 against that projectile. So, this completely shocked them because to give an idea of a percentage change for the 13, 
uh, inch range, which was a common thickness for the Vickers Harden. It was about 87 uh, plus or minus one versus the US 90. So it was about 3,000 off. However, at the 15 inches, it went from 82 versus roughly about 90. And unfortunately, the 26 inch turret face of uh, Yamato was at a 90 plus or minus three. There is no US equivalent average because they never made a plate that thick. So they were like, uh, we don't even know what to compare that to. Because the thickest plate they had made, I think, it was a 20 two inch homogeneous steel plate so they had no data correlate versus that plate mm-hmm. however what really started uh, overall they were about five to nine percent inferior of with the exception of you know plate three one three three or fifty tack three one three three so to compl- the actual read on the, the test directly for everyone. Uh, the details of ballistic tests are summarized in the photographs, as you can see them on the report, and I might actually pull them up for everyone. Problem is, it came from a microfilm, so black and white does not come out very well after microfilms. It kind of just shows black images unless you're looking right through the film itself, mm-hmm. with your own eye. It, it's an unfortunate downside to microfilm. I kind of hate it. However, although today they actually might be able to just use new digital processing microfilm and that actually would bring the pictures out. But the results of each plate are discussed brief, uh, briefly below. Japanese plate number 3133, ballistic limit of 118 plus 1. Average quality U.S. armor was 112.8. The best U.S. plate, uh, or one of, or two of the best U.S. plates that they could measure that was average quality. So some of the best U.S. plates um, was plate number one golf four six nine alpha one, which is seven point six inches, which is a, between a one one six and one one seven rating. So about a thousand less. Uh, and plate Romeo Romeo three two four, which was uh, seven inches, which had about a one seventeen. So so about a one below. Uh, versus uh, the 8-inch projectiles, as I stated before, the Jerry's plate of the 21 TAC-5, which is the, the basically the gold standard, it resisted at about 110 to 111 naval limit versus 109.7 of the average uh, quality U.S. armor. The best U.S. plate, which is that uh, one Golf 469 Alpha 1, was just at 112, so 1,000 over. And the best performing plate overall was German plate number 33032, which was taken from Germany, uh, from Corrupt Naval Yard, which actually was just at 113. Um, however, that was a cemented plate. So they stated that it can be seen from the above that plate number 3133 is slightly superior to the highest U.S. plates then tested with the 8-inch AP projectile Mark 21 Tac 3, but is slightly inferior when tested with the Mark 25 Tac 5 projectile. This plate is considered equal in quality to the best U.S. armor, and it is the only one of the 12 plates tested to have a limit above the U.S. average. Every other plate was considered below this. There is actually a post report. They spoke about it. There was actually another plate that Nathan Oaken and others have been trying to find the uh, data on. The British tested it. It was a 15-inch plate, and it surpassed every plate they had, and they had some some of the best armor in the world at the time. Hmm. And it completely skewed them because it was a Vickers Harden 15-inch plate. And they tried to recreate it, the same process. Like, you know, they told them how they made their own, and they couldn't get the same uh, chill depth. They couldn't get the same face hardness. It just boggled them how they did it, and it was superior to the one that they manufactured. So... It, they were not really sure how they managed to make it. Um, so the discussion is, uh, since the above conditions all existed in the Class A plates, those conditions being that um, impact has revealed this place to have poor impact properties in the normal tensile test, microtech, te- micro-etch test, and micro-examination show the place to have excessive dirt, a.k.a. Uh, considered dirty, they had too much slag. This undoubtedly explains the poor performance of the homogenous plates. 
Since the above conditions also existed in the Class A plates, and since all four plates showed a low face hardness and light chill, it's hard to explain the performance of plate number 3133. The amount of dirt necessary to affect the limit of a Class A plate is often greater than that for a homogeneous plate, hence why it's generally okay to have a little bit dirty for the face harden. And since... Um, and perhaps the effect of dirt may be dis, uh, discounted in this instance. The impact ductility of the plate number 3133, while not high, was the best of the four Class A plates. And as has already been pointed out, plate number 3133 had the hardest face and, de and uh, deepest chill. In addition, its back had the highest tensile strength. This combined combination of factors might account for the superiority of plate number 3133 over the other three plates, but seems insufficient to account for the very high limits found on this plate. Prior to the testing of the of uh, five inch uh, class A German plate number three four five six three, it was thought that a superior plate should have a high face hardness with the greatest depth of hardness that could be obtained, and since it would at least forty percent or more ductile uh, high strength back layer. Uh, that plate showed it was possible to have a superior plate with all the above attributes except the high face hardness. It was felt that by drawing the face of their plates at a higher temperature than the U.S. practice, the Germans lost hardness but gained more impact ductility on the face, meaning it was just breaking or fracturing. Plate number 3133, judged from either of the above criteria, has only a large amount of high tensile back to, to recommend it. The ballistic test shows that the high limit undoubtedly resulted from the ability of the plate to damage the projectile. Since this plate's chill characteristics differ so radically from those judged desirable and still performed well, it seems that a great amount of work must still be done in this field before optimum chill properties can be determined. Hmm. Basically, that plate broke their paradigm of what they thought should be done to make a good plate. Interesting. And that's worthy of note because the U.S. took this very seriously because post-war we were looking at the ways to manufacture the best as possible, not just for naval, but also for ground forces and vehicles. So the fact that plate uh, performed that well was, I won't say concerning, but it definitely intrigued them. Hmm. Uh, the problem is, is that they were never able to find the crew or the person who manufactured that direct plate because they had to look for some time. Br the British authorities did too on that 15-inch plate. The problem is, is that many of the personnel they believe might have been drafted into required forces as production was ramping down. Uh, home to fo uh, homeland forces and possibly might have been killed during the firebombing campaigns. Mm. So because of that, they lost the people who actually had developed these plates when we were discuss the manufacturing process. There was also a bit of skepticism that maybe they weren't telling them for secretive reasons. However, with how forthcoming they were with everything else, they didn't believe that to be the case. Okay. Uh, overall, it's been speculated that that plate, uh, because of its thickness, or at least I've personally speculated this because it was exact thickness or close to that thickness, that the uh, the B-65 uh, large cruiser's belt was going to be, oh. that it might have been them testing new armor types for that ship. Mm -hmm. That would make um, sense. I figured that out for some time because it's almost exactly at that rating of thickness. Yeah. And they did allocate funding for that, for the class of vessels. They did... Uh, set a date to lay it down, but the results of Midway basically had it scrapped. And it was believed that this plate was made in some time in 4142, which will put it right in the area where they would be starting to produce and develop these plates for that ship. Because the ship was expected to be launched and ready by 4445. That's really interesting, actually. Yeah. I guess that's probably a, a good place to... Um start wrapping up uh do you have any kind of uh you know a brief broad conclusion about japanese armor development i would say that probably the biggest conclusion is that they were given a hard set of circumstances that they had to develop from uh due to economic setbacks and a global depression and that they opted to go for something that was economical versus superior overall for uh ballistic reasons that being said, they did prove with experimental, experimental plate that they did have the knowledge and know-how if they had the resources to make a plate that was superior to the original requirements of the, of the Vickers symmetrical World War I criteria. Uh, 
They just, at the time, could not meet that criteria to meet the production demand of 1937. All right. And I guess with that, uh, we'll wrap up this chat, which has been very informative. For all of you who have made it through, you're, I guess you're part, officially part of the ultra-hardcore military history visualized <laughs> unit. Um, and we plan to actually do more follow-up chats on all sorts of stuff, aircraft carrier protection, damage control, guns and mountings, power plants, uh, etc., etc. So there'll be more of this kind of stuff uh, coming down the pipeline soon. And I'd like to uh, thank Stephen. Thanks for uh, taking your wonderful morning here to uh, talk armor with us. You're welcome. <laughs> and with that, I guess we'll sign off. See you next time.